the old order changed, yielding place to the new, were the closing words of the August 2017 judgment in the Puttaswamy case, where a nine-judge bench of the Supreme Court confirmed that the right to privacy is an inherent, unequivocal, fundamental right. This decision overturned the decades-old precedent of the Karak Singh and the MP Sharma cases where the same court had held that the Constitution of India did not guarantee this right to privacy. This judgment referred to the right to privacy as a natural primordial right and extended its protection against both state and non-state actors. Surveillance and data theft by both governments and companies can be deeply dangerous to the privacy, autonomy, and self-identity of persons and societies. In China, state surveillance is used to stifle dissent against the Communist Party with effectively no safeguards for free speech and severe consequences for anyone recorded to have anti-party views. In the United States, facial recognition software has been used to identify and target protesters and activists by federal law enforcement for arrest without standing warrants. At a conference in London chaired by the head of communications of NATO, social media and data surveillance has been identified as a tool increasingly used by governments to influence public opinion and fight information wars through psychological warfare and propaganda, both abroad and inside their own countries. Credit companies and banks can use your spending habits, both online and offline, without your permission and essentially classify you into financial pyramids which can affect your credit scores and your ability to get loans. Your data is very valuable to companies, governments and finance institutions and this value is generated at the cost of your psychological and physical autonomy. So, this data that belongs to you and can be deeply harmful in the wrong hands needs your permission to be shared and your consent and knowledge on who it is being shared with. In India, this conversation needs to happen urgently. In March this year, the government via the Department of Telecommunications called upon telecom operators to submit call records of all users from Delhi, Kerala, Jammu Kashmir and other areas with no recorded reason or basis for the surveillance of private citizens on such a massive scale. The National Social Registry is a project by the central government to essentially keep tabs on the personal and financial activities of all of India's 1.2 billion citizens. It is being designed to create a cross-departmental database of religious faith, caste data, financial records, educational qualifications, employment history and various other details of all of India's private citizens. It is also set to launch what has been called the world's largest facial recognition system by early 2021 with the express purpose of policing protests. Several scholars and activists have pointed out the grave dangers of this degree of systemic surveillance on one's own citizens and the immense power the possession of the private and personal data of 1.2 billion citizens gives to any individual, organization or even a ministry. The IT Act and rules govern the use and dissemination of private data in India. But given that data protection was not the primary aim of the Act in the minds of the drafters, and that only two sections in the Act deal with the subject at all, its protections are very lax. For starters, it does not protect against government surveillance, and corporate surveillance rules can be bypassed by regulatory arbitrage tactics very easily. In the wake of the situation, a committee under the leadership of retired Justice B. N. Shri Krishna was constituted to create a draft personal data protection bill. In this video, we'll see that the draft of this bill introduced by the government before the parliament serves only to strengthen the government's surveillance mandate and does nothing to safeguard the constitutional right to privacy of the Indian citizen. But before we get to government surveillance in this bill, we will discuss another major flaw of the bill with regard to collection of data by companies. The Justice Shri Krishna Committee clarified that the current mode of consent by the user to the collection of their personal data is deeply flawed or broken. 
studies have shown that less than 0.2% of users actually read the terms and conditions before downloading apps or new software before allowing the corporation to download their data. Another study shows that users spend no more than 6 seconds on the terms and conditions before proceeding to install the app or the software. And it's not your fault. These terms and conditions and licensing agreements are massive and boilerplate and often incomprehensible. This bill focuses on obtaining the consent of the users, which is great, but it entirely ignores the concept of any meaningful consent where the user knows what data will be collected and how it will be used. Instead, the bill focuses solely on obtaining consent for the sake of it, which can endanger anyone who cannot or does not strictly and accurately scrutinize the license agreement at length. By far, the most dangerous aspect of the bill is that it allows for increased state surveillance and allows for government agencies to completely opt out of the protections and safeguards that the bill sets. It allows the government to set its own standards for the collection of data with no regulatory oversight. It also creates the DPA or the Data Protection Authority with a wide mandate and overreaching powers. This authority with the mandate of promoting data privacy online will comprise of six members including the chairman who will all be appointed by the central government itself who also has the power if need be to remove anyone from the committee at will. Essentially, the central government is unregulated by this bill and can not only exempt itself from the protections offered in the bill but can also seize data stored by apps and other software via the DPA which is completely controlled by the central government. The DPA has enormous discretionary power to draft new rules and regulation with little to no transparency and the central government is empowered to lay down the procedure by which the DPA can promulgate these rules. Justice B. N. Shri Krishna led the committee which created the draft of the original bill. In an interview with the Economic Times in December 2019, Justice Shri Krishna condemned the revised bill that was presented by the central government before the parliament. He said that the overreaching powers granted to the government in this bill had the potential to turn this country into an Orwellian state, a metaphor often used to describe a state where government surveillance has reached dystopian extremes and when there is no privacy for private individuals. He also mentioned that the bill allows for the central government or any of its agencies to obtain private data anytime on the grounds of public order or sovereignty. We have already seen the misuse of government surveillance in countries like China, the US, the UK and across the world at large. This bill is a dangerous tool with no safety switch and can be used to end privacy as we know it. This means the end of independent thought and action when propaganda can be tailored to your own personal tendencies on the basis of your data and your behavior which will no longer belong to you.